Good morning, friends. Welcome to Hollywood United Methodist Church. I'm Rev. Hannah, one of our senior pastors here. And whether you're here in the room with us enjoying this warm, beautiful day, or whether you're joining us online from the comfort of your home, we hope that you are ready in your spirit to encounter a living God who loves us. So let us come into worship together. Thanks for coming up and joining. And if anybody has backpacks, we are still collecting. Annalie picked this one out. It has unicorns on it. Oh, somebody else got unicorns. Oh, horses, okay. There we go. You wanna have a seat? Pick this up. All right. So this was a big week for parents, for teachers, for kids. What did we start this week? Uh, we started school. <sighs> How many people went to a new school this year? Yeah. Did you go to a new school this year? Yeah. And we have a lot of teachers. You want to sit up? We have a lot of teachers. Uh, we have a lot of leaders. We have our Sunday school teachers. So if you had to sum up in one word how you felt about this week, what would you, what would you say? Tiring. <laughs> Tiring. Me too. Tiring. Tiring. How would you sum up this week? What do you think? 
I think her body language says tiring as well. <laughs> this was emotional, not just for you all, it was emotional for a lot of new teachers, and it was really emotional for some parents, myself included. It's a little bit sad when we see you go off to school and then we feel really excited when you come home and don't want to share what happened <laughs> sometimes, yeah. And I want to extend a special prayer because I know the last few weeks we talked a lot about what you go through, being tired, maybe a little excited. And I want to extend this week a special prayer, hi Lila Bell, to all of our teachers. Because I think our teachers are probably a little bit tired too, wouldn't you say? Um, so one of the activities we're going to do is we have little apples here. And we're going to write the name of a teacher. Um, it can be a spiritual leader, a Sunday school teacher, um, a coach, somebody who leads you. And we're going to think about them all week and say prayers for them. And this is the prayer that's going to be on the back that we're going to share. And I want to share this with you here. The apple, this apple isn't one that you can eat. But I hope you do still find it sweet. This apple is for you to keep. I'll keep another where I sleep. This is so that as I end each day, I can think of you and start to pray. I pray you'll always know that God is near, no matter what may come this year. All right, so that's a prayer that we're gonna say for all of our leaders and think about them as we go through the week. Uh, and today, uh, we can still bring in some backpacks that will be donated to LAUSD. And we're gonna go and have activities in the nursery today because it's air conditioned. All right, so let's bow our hair, uh, heads in a prayer for us as well. Dearest Lord, please bless all of our young people as they continue on their school journeys, as many of our youth go off into their high school and college journeys. It's a transition for all of us. And also, let us keep our teachers, our spiritual leaders, our Sunday school teachers, our coaches, and everyone else who, who helps us throughout the school year, including our parents and our families in mind. Please be with us and help us find peace as we all go through these transitions and change and find joy and comfort knowing you are always with us. And all God's children said, amen. amen. All right, as we go off to the nursery, we ask that all of you stand up, greet each other, and pass the peace as you are comfortable. Good morning. I think my mic is on. Hello, my mic is on. Hello. Good morning. Blessings each and every one of you. Uh, it's a joy to see you all. And maybe one more time, if you'll just turn where you are and wave up above for whoever's with us online. And may peace prevail on earth for all of us. And thanks for coming. And when there's a cyclovia going down Hollywood Boulevard, and we can uh, celebrate with those who are on their bicycles and those who are watching us online, and, uh, and we can be together in worship and full of joy and hope today. I'll invite you to kind of uh, take a deep breath and uh, take a moment uh, in prayer to have some silent prayer and lift up your hearts in praise and thanksgiving to God and silently the needs that are on your hearts as we begin to pray today. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, in the beauty of this place, we have come here to pray, to worship, to receive your healing and hope in our lives. 
We come from the struggles of, and the triumphs of this past week. We come seeking your soothing presence. Calm and still our souls. Cause us to rejoice in your presence, to be surrounded by your love, and even to give thanks for the blessing of apples as April shared with the children. It seems as though we just got started with summer, and now suddenly, here we are towards the end of summer and the beginning of school, and time seems to go so fast. We pray, O oh God, that you'll simply slow us down. Let us rest in you. O oh, patient creator, we often want the quick and easy answers to all of life's problems and questions. So we pray that you will show us your patience and we, you will show us your perseverance in our lives and help us to pursue the commitment that we make as your disciples through the rocky times and the smooth times alike. Give to us an extra measure of faith and commitment that we might truly serve you by loving other people we would ask that you will forever keep our hearts and our spirits open to hear your call so that we might continue to grow, and that we might find ourselves truly becoming love as you are love for us. We ask that you continue to heal and restore and prepare us for your work each day, that we might truly do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Hey, happy Sunday, everybody. Congratulations. You made it past the road closures. <laughs> uh, Cyclavia, did you all drive your bikes or ride your bikes over? Okay. <laughs> I was hoping somebody did. Um, it, is a nice, it is a beautiful morning here. Uh, I was just enjoying the courtyard outside just a little bit ago. Cool breeze. It's faint smell of pumpkin spice in the air, so you know fall's coming. So um, I'm glad you're here today. Made it through all the road closures. All right, let's check in, shall we? Get out those phones, scan that QR code. QR code for me if you would, and just drop your name in there and let us know you're here today. Also, people online, you can do the same thing at home. Uh, let us know you're here. If you'd like to be on the email list, you can put your email in there. But more importantly, if you have a prayer request to share, you can put a, your prayer request in there. And I collect those on Monday and I share them with the pastoral team. So please share uh, what you're able. Uh, if you are a first time visitor, I want to say a special welcome and thank you for sharing your morning with us. My name's Devin, and I'll be in the courtyard later after church, and I have a little welcome bag I'd love to give you, so come, come see me in the courtyard after church. Also, I want, uh, if you would all please help me, welcome our guest organist, Thompson Howell, today. Thompson, thank you for being here today while John is on vacation. I always appreciate when he's here. Just a few more films of our CrossFit, CrossFlick sermon series. Uh, today, of course, Rev. Hannah is going to be speaking about the film Rustin. And then next week, Kevin McCluskey is going to be here, and he's going to speak about the film Past Lives. So stay, uh, stay tuned for those. We only have one other coming up, and that will be Barbie, which will be a fun day as well. Also on the 25th next week, we have a couple things happening. We have 
our last summer ice cream Sunday social after church in the courtyard, so please be here for that. Lots of toppings, good ice cream. And then also our United Women in Faith group is having their potluck, which is open to anyone who's interested in being a part of that group this year. And they're just going to talk over things that they're planning for the upcoming year. So if you'd like to be a part of that, you can sign up at the welcome table as well. If you're interested in joining a small group this fall, talk to me or scan this QR code that's up on the screen ahead of, uh, in front of you. I'm looking for people who would like to lead, join, uh, and also just get some ideas of what uh, types of small groups you'd like to participate in. So see me after church or fill out the QR code if you would for me. And then, of course, we've heard it from April, but we are still collecting backpacks for, and school supplies for uh, LAS, LAUSD students in need. And we're going to do that all the way up through homecoming. So if you're out shopping at the Target or whatever, go ahead and, if you can, grab a few backpacks. Just bring them to church with you, and we'll place them on the stairs and bless them on the 22nd of September. Uh, I just got this uh, letter from the governance board that Larry asked me to read. But uh, as most of you are aware, Rev. Kathy is retiring on the 8th of September. And that day she'll be here preaching at the 11 a.m. service. And we're going to have a big party in the gym afterwards uh, to celebrate. Uh, but let me read this part from the governance board. Uh, the governance board will be gifting Rev. Kathy with several gifts on behalf of the church. And if you're interested in contributing to those gifts in advance, you can mail a check payable to the church, Hollywood UMC. Just make sure that you put in the uh, check memo line, Rev. Kathy Retirement Gifts, so they know where the money is going. But you can also donate through a uh, GoFundMe account that was just set up. And unfortunately, we don't have a slide yet for it, but we will next week. But those QR codes are at both welcome tables. So if you'd like to participate in this, you can scan those QR codes. But please join us on Sunday, September 8th, as we celebrate Rev. Kathy's 38 ministry and retirement. We have a lot of things happening over the next few months. We've planned uh, the next four months all the way through Christmas, and we'd love you to take one of these home with you. If you uh, just grab them, they're in your pew pocket or on the welcome table. Lots of events coming up and we'd love you to join as you're able. But all of these events, all of our outreach, are all provided by you. Through your prayers, your presence, your service, your volunteering, and your gifts. So as our ushers come forward and we put up a QR code for online giving, please give as you're able so we can continue to grow this ministry here in the heart of Hollywood. Thank you for being here today.
Our scripture reading today will be from the book of Matthew, chapters uh, 38 through 42. You have heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. Good morning, friends. I am so excited to be getting to talk with you this morning about really a hometown hero, which I'll get into, Bayard Rustin. I wanted to share, uh, I asked them to put up this book cover because I'm going to be drawing a lot from uh, some of the theology, uh, the biblical commentary from this book, The Politics of Jesus by O'Berry Hendricks. There's also a Politics of Jesus by Yoder and a Politics of Jesus by Miguel de la Torre. So like read all three of them if you really wanna have fun. Um, but I wanted to let you know that that's, a, that's a, something that I'm drawing from as well as what we all already know, which is the amazing film, Rustin. So an epic demonstration in our nation's capital, organized in eight weeks. Do this, Dr. King. Own your power. There's one person who can organize an event of this scale. <laughs> the hell would buy Rustin? His attention-grabbing antics make him an easy target. Ah! Let's not mention the unmentionable. Our new offices. A demonstration made up of angelic troublemakers such as yourselves. Make sure you are there. On August 28th, black, white, young, old, Rich, working class, poor, will descend on Washington, D.C. This new generation is restless and angry. The pacifist is opposed to using violence, but must be prepared to receive it. You're irrelevant. It's Friday night. I've been called worse. Your mere presence could derail the fight for racial justice in this country a good 10, 15 years. On the day that I was born black, I was also born a homosexual. Sometimes you gotta fight back to get We're to calling fight. for a peaceful march on Washington. We are committed to the cause of altering the trajectory of this country towards freedom. They either believe in freedom and justice for all. A surreal honor to get to stand here and to talk about such an amazing man. About uh, when I was in my 20s, a new high school opened in my neighborhood. Um, if you went to the end of my street to where it dead ended into the African Methodist Episcopal Church that was across the street from where Miss Beulah Derry lived in a big yellow house where I first started to sense the call of God sitting in one of those pews next to Beulah. And if you went down to the right, and you went down that road, you'd soon pass Cheney University, which is the first historically black university founded in the nation in 1837. When that road dead ended, if you turned left, you would be in front of Bayard Rustin High School. The man who had started off as a teenager in my hometown doing sit-ins before sit-ins were a thing, who knew even as a teenager and told his Ma Rustin that he preferred dancing with guys than gals, who spent so much of his life with people trying to crush him, erase him, that man, that man now holds the place of greatest honor in my neighborhood where I grew up. 
and his legacy is taught to the young. Bard was a great man, a relentless, creative, as you can see, energetic, joyful man. And one of the things that I find most powerful about him was that he was so passionately joyful and uncompromisingly faithful, no matter what the world said to him or about him. That faith came from his Methodist and his Quaker upbringing, raised like the great Simone Biles by his grandparents, his Methodist grandfather and his Quaker grandmother, who he called Ma Rustin. His upbringing in those powerfully justice-focused traditions of Methodism and Quakerism instilled in him a commitment to living differently. His upbringing in a household where he was loved just as he was, bold, joyful, and gay, enabled him to bring all three of those gifts into the world with full force. As a Quaker, Byard grew up in a world deeply immersed in pacifism and went on to focus on that in the early years of his career, refusing to engage in military service because of religious beliefs and working for the Fellowship of Reconciliation. His convictions led him to India, where he studied with Gandhi, and he brought back those teachings and practices of nonviolent resistance to teach to his mentee, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. As one of the film's characters, if you've seen it, says to him, so Dr. King's stance on nonviolence, he got that from you. To which Bayard responds, by way of Jesus Christ, Gandhi, and Thoreau. He gave credit where credit was due because he learned from teachings like the ones we heard in Matthew today, so beautifully read. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil man. So often this verse and those that follow are misinterpreted as teaching passivity rather than pacifism. What people miss is that Jesus is speaking to an oppressed group of people who are colonized by the Roman Empire, whose daily life is terrorized by military occupation. In the face of that reality, he is giving tactics to people who are under the boot of Rome about whole, how to hold on to their dignity as children of God, how to assert themselves with nonviolent tactics rather than returning violence with more violence. <clears throat> As O'Berry Hendricks writes in The Politics of Jesus, he is not speaking to the abusers but to the subjects of abuse, about how to exercise power when you are overpowered. These are tactics for how to survive without losing yourself, for how to believe that a better world is still possible when it might look impossible. Not merely one where those who are oppressed become the oppressor themselves, but a world in which we are seeking to end oppression altogether. As black lesbian warrior poet Audre Lorde wrote, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. To change the world, you have to change the system, the way that you relate within the system, the structure, the methods. To repair the world, you cannot merely replace the main characters in the script with new actors and continue shooting the film. You have to tell a new story, Jesus tells us. You have to write a new script. You have to build a new stage. So let's get into it. Verse 39 says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. This verse is historically often been taught as passive acceptance of violence. This is because it has often been those who have the power and sometimes are doing the oppressing themselves, who have the most control 
over the interpretation and the teaching throughout history. However, when we look at this through the lens of the oppressed, the overpowered person, this is actually a way to hold on to your dignity. It is a way to reveal the oppressor for what they are. The bully hits, insults, slaps, and expects us to bow our heads. To hold up one head and turn the other cheek to offer it up unbroken and unbowed is an act of strength and dignity, of knowing your identity as a child of God and a person of equal worth. It is, in the words of the first black woman to run for president, Shirley Chisholm, to be unbought and unbossed. When the oppressor comes to heap abuse and continues, they are revealed more and more and more as what they are. I imagine these words from Jesus were echoing in his mind as we see Bayard Rustin in the film, repeating the phrase over and over, I am not resisting, I'm not resisting, as police officers charge onto the bus where he is sitting in an act of nonviolent resistance, refusing to give up his seat in order to protest racist laws about where people could sit on buses as Rosa Parks would later do. Before the police grab Bayard and beat him and drag him from the bus, he is questioned about why he won't just move. Why won't he just get up? And he says, of the white child who is sitting across the aisle from him in the next row, if I move, this child will never know an injustice is taking place. If he bows his head, if he goes along with it, they will not have to reveal to that child their truly violent nature and maybe make that child reject that and want to be different like Bayard. So he does not resist, but neither does he comply. He refuses to be complicit in his own oppression. He refuses to help them oppress him. He does not bow. He holds his head up and turns the other cheek to take the blow. He makes them reveal their violence. Nonviolent resistance is not an act that is free of violence. It can be very violent. It is merely the willingness to endure violence from others in a public way in order to reveal that violence and the perpetrators of it rather than commit the violence oneself. It is in the words of O'Berry Hendricks to assert your somebodiness. It is to say, you can threaten me, you can harm me, but you cannot control me, you cannot break me. And by continuing simply to exist and hold my head up, oppression begins to crack. By taking the violence done every day in the shadows and the corners and the darkness of night and exposing it to the sunlight, to the public, to the cameras, the whole collective community is forced to reckon with what are we truly willing to allow. It is easy to ignore harm when we don't have to see it. But when face to face with abuse that has been hidden, when forced to face it, the collective consciousness of society must own their own responsibility in allowing the behavior and decide whether they want to continue to be complicit. As Walter Wink called this, a way by which evil can be opposed without being mirrored, the oppressor resisted without being emulated, the enemy neutralized without being destroyed. Jesus does not teach an eye for an eye, does not encourage us to seek revenge as the means of repairing the world. But that does not mean that he is permissive about allowing harm to continue 
unchecked, unhindered, unhinged. He teaches <clears throat> an overpowered people how to bring about change, or at the very least, how to remain unchanged themselves, how to remain unchanged themselves by the violence that's heaped upon them. Verse 40 tells us, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. For a colonized and an occupied people like the audience that Jesus is speaking to, there was a constant mental trauma of not having control of their own land, their own possessions, their own property, of the fact that any and all of what they had was occupied and could at any minute be taken from them. So once again, Jesus offers them a way to hold on to their dignity, their somebodiness, to remember that they are a child of God, even when they're not treated that way, to reveal the oppressor without using the tactics of the oppressor. For people who usually only had one shirt and one coat, he says to them, if they take your shirt, give them your coat. By giving them everything and standing there exposed yourself with nothing, you expose them. You reveal them for what they are. Expose yourself and they can't expose you. Give and they have nothing left to take. And you have nothing left to fear. That is what those of us who are gay do when we come out. We expose ourselves. We show that we are not ashamed of who we are and we cannot be threatened and intimidated into silence anymore. Bayard Rustin says in that clip, on the day I was born black, I was also born a homosexual. In a world that sought to attack him for both identities, the love that Ma Rustin had instilled in him helped him to hold on to his joy and his confidence. Yet, he also had an Achilles heel. In the film, by Rustin's kryptonite was the word Pasadena. Why Pasadena for a man on the East Coast? The day he was arrested for being with another gay man in Pasadena, California, right up the road, is the memory and the public shaming that haunts Byard. His arrest there long before had been publicized and used to intentionally humiliate him in an attempt to weaken what was in that time period the greatest threat to injustice. The organizing power and genius of a man named Rustin. This is what makes it hard for him to convince the major civil rights leaders to support his vision of the march on Washington and allow him to lead the organizing. In one scene well into the film, Congressman Powell, in an attempt to get Byard kicked off the organizing committee, just repeats the word Pasadena in the meeting over and over again until Byard is triggered and silent. But while Byard's almost unshakable confidence falters, love steps in. The love of the community, the love of the allies, the love of his friends. As his friend, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King once said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hatred cannot drive out hatred. Only love can do that. So Martin Luther King, he gets on the television. They had tried to control and intimidate King to take his voice from him, to erase his friendship with Bayard, and to diminish the power that he could bring. King had been warned that if he acknowledged Rustin, that they would say that Bayard was King's own lover. So King got on the television when they tried to threaten him with taking his shirt, and he gave them the whole coat. He gave them his truth. Rustin is one of the most moral, 
one of the most decent human beings I have ever known. He is as committed to American democracy as any current elected official and would fight to protect the rights of all, <clears throat> including those who would use the power of their position to deny him his. I'm proud to call him friend. I can't think of a finer person to lead us into Washington, D.C. <laughs> Tied his reputation to Bayard. And they could not use Bayard to threaten King anymore. King's friendship with Rustin was no longer a secret that could be taken from him. They tried to take his shirt and he gave his cloak. He left himself completely exposed yet more powerful than he'd ever been, with his friend at his side, fully and publicly, because he protected him. Expose yourself, Jesus teaches us. Give away what you fear will take place. Don't place your confidence in your possessions or your reputation. Reveal what you've kept hidden, and no one can shame you anymore. Verse 41, and this is the last one we'll have time for. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Once again, Jesus teaches a colonized people that when everything has been taken from you, including the control of your own body, make space for your own choices. Take back your bodily autonomy. A Roman soldier could force someone to carry their property for up to a mile. So Jesus says, if they make you do that first mile, you choose to do the second. And in the very act of choosing to serve, you take control of the whole situation. You take away their feeling that they ever made you do anything to begin with. You take back your bodily autonomy. You will not control this body. You cannot define what it is worth based on what you make me do. You cannot demean me with menial tasks that you feel you can force me to do. If I choose to do the task, choose to treat it as if it has value, choose to do it with love for another person, then I take back my bodily autonomy. Jesus helps them protect their dignity in the midst of those who treat them in such undignified ways. In the final scene of the film, after Bayard has planned and executed such a powerful and historic event as the March on Washington. I won't ask how many of you were there or alive at the time. He is starting to clean up. Word comes to the male leaders that the president has, of course, felt the impact of the March on Washington and wants to invite them to come and be in his office to meet and talk. A young John Lewis of good trouble fame protests that Rustin should not be picking up trash and cleaning up as he's doing. He should be with them because he's the one who put all this together. Yet Rustin says in the film, I said, I said that I would happily act as trash collector if we pulled today off. And when they continue to try to protest that, that he shouldn't be picking up the trash, that he should be with the powerful people, he says, Ma Rustin taught me that no man is less valuable because he picks up trash to care for his own. So they go off to their meeting with the president and they leave behind the man who had strategized and organized and put everything all together. And as his young followers watch him, Rustin makes his way around the mall in the nation's capital, picking up trash and dropping it in his bag. The other men have tried to, to define the task as one that is beneath him, but he reminds them that it is not the role that defines the person, but the person that defines the role. 
As Stanislavski said, there are no small parts, only small actors. The value of the person is not whether they sit on the throne or whether they polish the throne. In God's eyes, it is not worldly power or fame that determines worth. It is what do you do with what you're given? Will it be good? Will it be kind? Will it be true? Will it be just? You can have a great deal of power, a great deal of money, a great deal of influence, even start your own social media platform. But what do you do with it? Rustin was content to finish the most powerful day of his life picking up trash because it is a dignified and a worthy job and one through which he could show love for his fellow humans. When you're reading the story of the feeding of the 5,000, did you ever wonder about who picks up the trash at the end? Matthew 14.20 tells us the disciples picked up the broken pieces. So often we use that as a way of showing how much was left over and how much power Jesus had, but we miss the point that just like Bayard was going around and picking up the trash around the mall, the leaders were going around and picking up the trash. Where do we find ourselves in these stories? The feeding of the 5,000, the march on Washington. Do we walk away when the fun is over and expect someone else to clean up after us? Or like the disciples, do we show love by picking up what's left on the ground? Gathering it up like they did in their baskets, like Rustin did in his bag. We do not declare our dignity in what we see as beneath us. We declare it by refusing any task or any person to be defined as beneath us. We declare it by lifting our head and turning our cheek when someone expects us to put it down. We declare it by honoring the image of God in us and in others. We declare it by living with our secrets exposed so that no one can make us feel ashamed or like they can control us anymore. They cannot take what we give. They cannot expose what we don't hide. They cannot make us respond with violence to their violence. And they cannot make us feel like we are less just because they treat us that way. Jesus teaches us how to change the community and how to change the world by what we do and how we live within it. Glory to God. Amen.
Thank you, thank you. Thank you to all of our folks up in the booth, to our ushers, to our techs, to our facility techs, to everyone, and to each of you who took the time to bring your energy into the room and to create what we've created together as a moment to worship our Lord. Thank you to you who are joining us wherever you are, whether near or far. Know that you are loved and you're remembered in this place. As we finish, uh, um, Bishop Swenson is going to be down at the front uh, if you would like to receive communion. I encourage you to have a safe and a happy Sunday and a week in which you seek to do things differently so that the world can be different. Go forth in peace, knowing that there is nothing that is beneath our God. No task that Jesus wasn't willing to take on. No mistake that he wasn't willing to forgive. And that he calls you to live that out with love. Amen. <laughs>